My name is Matt Pruitt. I'm the deputy director of the Radical Exchange Foundation. And uh, I should say that I'm, I'm not an economist. Uh, my, I'm several things, including a programmer and a uh, writer, but my primary qualification is as a lawyer. Um, I've spent most of the past several years as a uh, plaintiff side antitrust litigator. Um, and so I kind of come at these questions about mechanism design from a little bit more of a, a legal philosophical justice oriented perspective, which I hope will add something to this conversation. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm calling this talk Ownership and Punishment. And that is a little bit of a play on the dyad of uh, reward and punishment. Um, and what I'm getting at is I think that we, uh, we don't often enough consider the idea that private property um, is, um, is actually a, a, a reward uh, in, in, in the sense of being the inverse of, of, uh, of, of punishment. In other words, it should bear some relationship to, um, uh, to, to conduct that we, that we want to reward. Um, so the, if you think about the relationship between justice and efficiency, uh, for example, the, um, uh, uh, the law and economics movement has for a long time suggested that by taking an efficiency-oriented approach, um, they can have, you know, have something valuable to add to uh, conversations in the judicial realm or, or in, the, in the philosophical realm about, about justice. And I don't, um, I don't think that that is wrong. Um, I, however, I do think that the relationship is a little bit complicated. It gets a little squirrely at times. And most importantly, it actually goes both ways. In other words, I think that by looking at things from a, uh, from a perspective of justice, uh, we, we are likely to find out something valuable about efficiency as well as the other way around. So uh, um, Henry George, uh, the famous uh, uh, or somewhat forgotten, but uh, having a little bit of a moment, uh, uh, writer, journalist, economist from the late 19th century, um, had a famous thought experiment. And uh, I want to take through that thought experiment really briefly because I think that it illustrates his, uh, his central insight, uh, his central contribution. And the, the thought experiment is this. You imagine, a, uh, imagine a, an infinite, uh, featureless, uh, unoccupied plain. In other words, an a, a, a expansive land with, with no features, nobody on it. Uh, now imagine a, uh, a single person embarking out on that plane trying to find a place to settle. Uh, it's obviously an arbitrary choice. Uh, he or she can just uh, throw a dart and uh, pick a spot and uh, build a homestead. No place is any better or any worse than any other place. Now, suppose that happens. Um, he or she builds a homestead um, and uh, a farm, and it's quite difficult. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not rich. They have to perform all the tasks themselves. They have to farm themselves. They have to build their own house. They have to be their own blacksmith. They have to make their own clothes. Uh, maybe they can eke by, but they're not going to be rich. Uh, now imagine a second settler comes out uh, onto that plane. So for this second settler, the choice of where to settle is no longer an arbitrary one. There's a clear right answer. The second settler should, uh, will find it most advantageous to settle down somewhere near the first settler. Uh, the reason for that is that after, after settling down, those two can now trade with each other. If one of them is better at blacksmithing, then that person can spend more time with blacksmithing. If one of them is better at uh, farming, that one can spend more time farming. Uh, so they will both be richer. Um, for the you know, and this process can go on ad infinitum. For the third settler, it's the same. The, the most advantageous place to settle will be near the first two. If you iterate this a million times, you can imagine eventually you've got a, uh, a thriving, uh, a thriving little, little city, which could be generating a lot of wealth. You might also imagine that the, um, the first settlers who, who initially had farms in this land have now become urban landlords uh, who are making a lot of money from rent. Um, new settlers who are coming to this town, or you know, let's not call them settlers, new people coming to this town, will, um, you know, they, 
not necessarily going to be rich because it's going to be expensive to live there. They're going to have to pay a lot of money uh, to the in initial property owners for the privilege of being there. Okay, so this, the sen what this shows, I think that George's insight here, uh, properly understood, is, uh, it has to do with where value comes from. It shows that the value, the value in land, uh, at least in this ideal situation, but it, it, it's applicable to real situations as well, the value in land comes from the network of people uh, uh, participating in an economy. So in other words, the value in land is uh, network value. Okay, so Henry George uh, made a distinction between two kinds of capital, uh, artificial capital and natural capital. Artificial capital, things like buildings, machines, the products of labor. Natural capital, things like coastlines, mountains, natural resources, he would have called, said, made by God. So, the, and he, his idea was to tax the income from natural capital, uh, not tax the income from artificial capital. Um, these categories, uh, while they're interesting, they're a little bit hard to work with, they're a little bit metaphysical, so if we want to try to bring this insight into a, a workable mechanism, we need to update them a little bit. And um, the, uh, the way to, what, one way to do that is to think, is to say that all right, things that are made by labor are really things brought about by incentives. So uh, the reason somebody built a building is, is because they were trying to make money. Uh, you know, the, whereas natural capital like land is maybe valuable, but it was not brought about by incentives. Uh, you know, which is why you know taxing the latter doesn't doesn't distort um, incentives. Okay. Um, another important thing, though, is that is that Henry George kind of uh, kind of drew a dichotomy here. Um, and I think that was a bit of a mistake because the question is not really we're not we don't really want to try to categorize objects. We don't. We in fact we want to uh, we want to get, understand where value comes from. So in other words, any given any given piece of capital has some of its value is brought about by incentives, whereas some of its value is going to be brought about by these kinds of network processes that are illustrated by the uh, Savannah thought experiment. Um, and you know the fact that th this fact, the fact that any piece of capital has has contribution to its value from both of these types of sources, both of these processes, is really why Henry George's ideas didn't quite work. It was this was the the principal difficulty with administering uh, what he what he called the single tax. Okay, so. Um, uh, drilling down into this a little bit, the idea here is that we're looking for the sources of value in things. We're not trying to, you know, metaphysically categorize objects, because really, all the, the value of all capital uh, comes from humans. If there were no humans, nothing would have a market price. The question is, what kind of human activity caused the value to emerge? Was it uh, was it caused by incentivized work, or was it caused by complex network interactions and network effects that lent value to the capital. The uh, nifty thing about, the, uh, about Harburger taxation or the cost mechanism, which I'll assume a little bit of familiarity with in this room, is that... Uh, How many people know what the cost mechanism is? Raise your hand. So okay. that's what you can and cannot assume that. Okay. Well uh, <laughs> I will I'll briefly um, I'll briefly outline it. It's basically the idea that if you it's um, if you own a piece of property, you have to um, you assess it, you you self assess it, and your self assessment is the basis from which a property tax is calculated, the catch being that uh, if somebody comes along willing to pay the self-assessed value, you have to sell it to them. Um, 
And uh, there, there are some more ins and outs, but I, I don't want to get too, too bogged down in it. It seems like many people um, know what it is. So the, um, uh, this spec, now, all right. The idea of the, of, the, of the cost tax is that it should vary with the turnover rate uh, of the property. Um, but I want to point out that there's another important question that we need to ask besides the turnover rate of the property when we, if we want to set the cost tax at the proper level. And that question is where, where, that, where the tax should be between zero and the turnover rate. So the turnover rate is the, is the highest level that you could set the cost tax at without um, actually decreasing uh, allocative efficiency. So in other words, if you had a piece of, of capital that was pure natural capital, that was purely non-responsive to incentives, you still wouldn't want to go any higher than the, uh, than the turnover rate when you're setting that Harburger tax. By contrast, if you had, if you had something that was Matt, could you just explain turnover rate? Yeah, sorry. So the, the turnover rate is um, the turnover rate is the probability of an asset uh, finding a finding a buyer within a given period of time. So let's say you have um, uh, uh, let's say you have a a hundred dollar asset and there's a ten percent chance within a year that it will find a new buyer. Then the tur then the turnover rate would be would be ten percent. And according to this. Uh, in, in this system, it would have a 10% property tax rate during that period of time. Okay. The, um, uh, and, all right, so back to the spectrum, right? This, this, this spectrum, uh, if, if you had pure artificial capital, you would actually want the, uh, the Harburger tax rate to be, to be 0% um, in order to maximize the incentive to create more of it. Keep in mind, these are really just ideal categories. Almost everything you can imagine is some mixture of uh, artificial and natural uh, capital value. OK. Let's talk about another old time philosopher, uh, John Locke. So John Locke's. Uh, idea about just property claims ran generally as follows. It was that uh, in order for a just private property claim to arise, you had to uh, mix your labor with the land. In other words, you find a piece of unoccupied land, you mix your labor with it, and by virtue of that, you gain some property interest in it. it he uh, added what is called the proviso, the uh, caveat to that, which is that your claim to the land is uh, uh, only valid to the extent that enough and as good, as he said, uh, is left over for others to claim, mix their labor with, and gain a property claim in the, through the same sort of process. So there's been, over the you know, past few centuries, there's been a lot of analysis of the proviso uh, people who've tried to tried to sort of um, uh, launder it away, in my view. But I think that if you take it very seriously, if you you you, you will, uh, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that um, uh, that most property is, in some sense, burdened by most private property claims are, in some sense, burdened by this proviso. In other words, if we go back to the scenario of the uh, um, of the of the settlers on this on this unbounded savanna, the uh, there's an infinite amount of land out there, but it's not as good. The, uh, the the land closest to the urban center is going to be clearly uh, preferable and more valuable than the land farther. So there's really never quite enough and as good left over, which means that uh, if you take it seriously, this this the proviso. Um, burdens most uh, private property claims. Um, and uh, that kind of links back to this because if, if you think, if you look, if you think about the, uh, the Harburger tax rate as 
uh, as sort of a just a little um, uh, encumbrance on a claim to title, then you know a a, a low um, a low tax reflects the same insight that Locke had when he suggested that you know it's, there might there the the, the proviso provides at least some small shadow on a, a private property claim. Okay. Now I want to uh, link this up with the, go back to the idea that property is a reward. So if we think about, um, if we think about property as a, as a reward, uh, it seems to me that we, we could subject it to a similar kind of analysis to which we subject uh, punishments. In other words, you know, you might think of of uh, the government as presenting society with carrots and sticks. We're governed by carrots and sticks. The uh, uh, punishment is uh, sticks, and the great carrot governing activity in our society is uh, is ownership, right? So the it, the same sort of analysis that we uh, that we use when we think about the justice of punishments arguably tells us something about the justice of uh, property claims. Uh, it's worth noticing just the, the kind of links between these two institutions. So first of all, it, you can't have, you can't protect private property claims unless you also have a system of punishment. The, the one depends on the other in a, in a very simple sort of way. Uh, also, every time you recognize a claim of private property, you're concomitantly recognizing an array of acts which are punishable. Um, these would be the crimes against property. Uh, you know, and you're exempting the owner, of course, but you're uh, recognizing an array of acts uh, for which people may be punished, which is actually very similar to the process of defining a crime. So the idea of subjecting private property claims to the same sort of analysis that we, sub that we uh, use when we think about the justice of punishment is um, you know, not too crazy. So how do we justify punishment? There, uh, very, uh, uh, very cursorily, there are sort of two general buckets of justifications that we think about, uh, which are you know, retributivism and consequentialism. Uh, these are two sort of classifications of justifications of punishment. Um, a, a helpful way of thinking about them is that Retributivist punishments are backward looking in time, and consequentialist, uh, consequential, sorry, back, uh, retributivist justifications are backward looking in time, where consequentialist justifications are forward looking in time. So, consequentialist justifications would include things like uh, deterrence or incapacitation. Retributivist justifications of punishment would be uh, uh, more along the lines of, you know, in virtue of you having done something blameworthy, you deserve something bad to happen to you. That's the basic structure of retributivist uh, justifications for punishment. Now, these kinds of justifications actually map on to the justifications of private property in a pretty straightforward way. Private property, uh, you could also think of as having backward-looking and forward-looking justifications. Um, the most of the conversations that we've had in you know recent decades about the justifications of private property have been purely forward-looking. They've been purely consequentialist. In other words, we focus on efficiency. Efficiency justifications are forward-looking. They're they're based on the idea that by have by having the system of private property we have, some happy <coughs> events will occur in the future. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying anything against that. Um, but I do think that, uh, I actually think that both uh, sides of the timeline matter. And it's also interesting to observe that if, um, if, a, if a cost mechanism or, or a similar Harburger tax mechanism actually does end up telling a superior story to traditional private property about efficiency, in other words, if we could, if we could come up with something more efficient than a um, uh, than, than private property, then our attention would, ha would necessarily sort of be redirected to the backward-looking, 
reward-oriented, dessert-oriented type justifications for the institution. Um, returning to Locke, I think that Locke's story is actually quite attentive to this. It's attentive to the idea that both forward-looking and backward-looking justifications are important. Uh, you can see the kind of backward-looking uh, structure uh, of his thinking in, uh, in the following observation, right? He said that what, the, way that it, the, way that a property, the way that a just property claim arises is you go out, you mix your labor with the land, and then a property claim arises. Otherwise, he might have said something else. He might have said, he might have said well, why don't we just um, uh, prospectively grant people private property claims to give them incentives to uh, go out and, and, and farm the land? He didn't. He didn't put it that way, and I think that um, that, that you know sort of suggests a, a kind of sophisticated uh, uh, view of of property as having both forward-looking and backward-looking um, grounds. Um, so on this last slide, I say a little bit about um, uh, the idea of network effects. The uh, important thing to uh, observe. Is that you know so much of the so much of the value uh, in our in our property or in our capital is is caused not by incentivizable uh, activity or not by um, um, uh, the the sorts of things that we can easily incentivize, but by these really complex uh, network effects that occur extrinsic to the property. Um, and uh, for which the property owner cannot necessarily be um, um, logically uh, rewarded. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, thanks. And uh, happy questions. For the benefit of the economists in the room, what is justice? <laughs> it's justice is, I would say justice is uh, an interpretive concept. And the, the process of deciding what justice is, is uh, uh, sort of a, a game that we're all playing together that helps you know, define who we are and define uh, what our societies look like. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I have a very silly question on um, this kind of spectrum we lined up about, thank you, about natural versus artificial capital, right? Yeah. How to kind of think about that. So I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. So, um, I mean, am I getting it correctly, first of all, maybe that, you know, if you think about um, natural capital, so say oil reserves. Sure. So that's kind of a natural capital, correct? Right? Yeah. So what about uh, computer chips made from rare metals? Right? So it's Probably still somewhere in the middle, maybe, or is it completely on the artificial side? Well, so I would, I actually, I actually don't think that anything is at either extreme in a perfect sense. That right. the extremes are things that you are, are asymptotically approached. Right. But uh, you know, the, uh, uh, a device like like an iPhone, uh, which has rare metals in it, clearly has uh, natural and artificial. It, it has all kinds of artificial components because it has technology and because it well, the labor went into it. And so on. Uh, at the same time, in a in a rough sense, you could think of its natural capital value as its its scrap value. Right. I, I guess my, my question is: Let me give you three three examples, or maybe four, and you tell me where where do they fall in the spectrum, right? Okay. And, and just to, because I'm I, I find it hard to make. The, I'm not sure if this if I get that this spectrum is going to be right to think about it in some applications, right? So what about data, right? So think think about Twitter, for mm -hmm. example, right? So where does Twitter fall? Where does wind or solar energy fall? Where does atomic energy fall? And what about, say, milk produce? So these are, I think that these are all, um, these are all in between, clearly. Um, but the um, the idea is that by looking at investment elasticity of an asset, you get a pretty good proxy. For where it falls on that spectrum, 
So in other words, if, it's, if, if an asset is in, completely inelastic to investment, then it looks more like natural capital. If it's highly elastic, it looks more like artificial capital. Yeah, go ahead. So this is just to follow up on Preston's point, because actually your work has persuaded me that the distinction you drew is not the right one. So it's not something <laughs> I realized before, but it's from hearing you talk about it, which is that it seems to me like one of the most fundamental mistakes in, in like what I and Anthony and people like us wrote about this stuff was to think that there is this individual who invests and then there's the rest of society. And that everything in the society realm is like natural capital, it's created by network effects, which is some complete abstraction, and then there's the individual who makes the investment. When what I've come to think is that actually everything is some combination of different networks contributing to it, and that really value has to sort of be distributed across different hierarchies of different networks, and that the notion that networks are just complex and not created by incentives is actually totally wrong. I don't think as networks actually like giving the property the network actually incentivizes the network to invest in it. And there's all these sort of collective. Anyway, I'm just yeah. curious. No, what you I, think about. I, I agree with that, and I, I don't mean to make the, the claim that um, that network network effect value is uh, is immune to incentives. I, I I don't think that's the case. Um, and um, uh, the question is just how to uh, uh, how to find useful proxies for you know what's incentivizable and what's not incentivizable. And uh, you know the idea of investment elasticity is clearly of, of an imperfect proxy. But um, uh, you know I, I guess I'll leave it to the economists to come up with a better one. Yeah. So I had another question about justice. Yeah. And I think that so. There seems to be a problem in reallocating resources that are currently allocated using 0%, basically, for perpetual licenses. In the sense that, basically, as you said, or as you alluded to, 200 years ago, America allocates most of its land sort of, sort of free for all, and then allocates it under, basically, perpetual licenses. Yeah. Presumably, they do that because they don't know what a Harburger license is, because no one's invented that yet, and sort of, there seems to be a problem now that sort of yeah. we cannot ex sort of you could expose change the contract and just say this is the just kind of contract and they only didn't do that back then because they didn't have that yeah. and so now it's null and void and now we're just taxing you but yeah. it seems like there's a trade off between efficiency and sort of respecting the contracts that a government in the past made that it may not have made made it made inefficiently for technological reasons yeah. so I guess what are your thoughts on well so okay so i think that if Th what this is really about is about the uh, the initiation of property claims. So if, if a property claim a property claim might have been sort of unjustly initiated, but then it could thereafter be justly transferred. So somebody who somebody who bought that unjustly created property claim has a um, has a some sort of a uh, I don't I don't even want to use the word right, but they have some sort of a claim to it that has to be taken seriously. You know, and I'm, I, I the question of how to how to get from the situation we're in to a more just situation is an incredibly complex one, you know, for a whole another presentation, you know. But I, I, I still think that there's value in in uh, thinking about you know the goal we should be striving towards, yeah. and that's kind of what I'm doing. I mean, I, I guess yeah. I'm actually pushing it a bit further than you are in saying sort of. Is there, from a legal perspective, a legitimate claim to say something like, we are going to ex post change the terms of this contract because the old governments only committed to a very inefficient contract because there was no more efficient contract. Sort of, is that a strong enough defense to actually take existing property and change its terms? I, I don't think that that would fly in a federal court. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting argument. I mean, there, you know, there, there are two kinds of ways of looking at it. One is the sort of classroom legal philosophy, and the other is what would work in court. Um, and I think that uh, uh, from, the, from the former perspective, maybe from the latter perspective, I think we, we would need to com changes, in, changes in norms and, and changes in the way that, that judges think and, and people think to even begin to, to entertain something like, like that. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's just a brief follow-up on this uh, on this exchange. It seems like we we, we can't legally uh, deprive someone of their property, but we can legally change the tax law. 
And so I, I, I think sort of that's that's part of the point is to think yeah, about yeah. how you know that can be accomplished to uh, achieve some of the results that you might think are more just. Well, again, you know, it depends on the jurisdiction whether you can do that or not, and it depends what the nature of the tax is. So it, it's actually the answer to that question is pretty complicated. Yeah, and I, I mean the I um, converting from uh, the private property system we have now to a cost mechanism, Harburger mechanism, is definitely, arguably, uh, a, a takings under the takings clause. Uh, so. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned that you were a lawyer at heart. So I was a little disappointed that you didn't bring into your unbounded savannah and all your other discussions um, the reality that rule of law, property rights, contract rights, um, away from the developed markets are constantly in flux. So I look at your unbounded savannah, I look at that first person that settles, then I look at that second person, and you start you talk about them creating value and other people coming around. I get worried that the first person and the second person get that value expropriated almost immediately by the other people that come in and undermine their property rights. Um, so what kind of assumptions are you using to create all of your theor theoretical, because you know, in the world that I live in, in the frontier markets and the emerging markets, property rights don't exist, or they only exist until they don't exist, and the incentive structures are very, very difficult to create if people don't have the confidence that what they create actually can be saved. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm assuming that this is a, a frontier with a with a with a, a strong sheriff who's enforcing perfect private property rights. That's that's the assumption. Um, uh, in uh, yeah, it, it's a completely different analysis if those private property rights are not guaranteed. It's it's just meant to illustrate how uh, private property rights work. Yeah. I found it interesting that. Um, Justice appeared in your title, and then you you pretty much didn't use it um, in all of the speaking after that. And um, I found it a little bit of a red herring because it has so much baggage um, for everyone. It's overdetermined, and people bring to it, including you, um, what you bring to it. Uh, the two pieces in your presentation that stood out for me as something that had less baggage and that were core to, to what you were proposing were sources of value. Mm -hmm. And then the idea of backward looking and forward looking rewards to private property. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things that. Okay. And so I'm curious, do you know in your work um, as an antitrust lawyer and, and presumably in some way or the other dealing with economic analyses in that work, or from the economists you engage with, are there people working on these as analytical categories, sources of value, and backward-looking and forward-looking rewards to private property? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, yeah. I've, I, I've never heard that discussed in, a, in the antitrust. I may be missing something. I don't know if everything there is to know, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think in antitrust there is quite a lot of analysis about that. Could you, could you say specifically what, when you say that, or that? Do you want to do it, or? Mm, not, not quite clear <laughs> what that would be. Well, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of analysis in antitrust about the notion that, like, monopoly power can be a reward for innovation, and that you don't want to penalize that sort of thing. So that's, like, a huge focus of the law and monopolization. So that, but on the other hand, like if in some sense that backwards versus forwards looking thing is like the central issue in most antitrust law because you're trying to like on the one hand deal with the distortion created by the monopoly, but on the other hand you don't want to discourage um, innovation that creates monopoly power. So that's pretty central there, that distinction. And sources of value, um, like if you think about, for example, um, Fran, this is like when you, in order to join a standard setting organization, make a commitment to have low prices, there's a notion of what's fair and reasonable, and that's all determined by like how much of the value 
was a result of the fact that you joined the standard setting organization and therefore you got some monopoly power because you're part of the standard, which is this network effect thing, versus like how much was like the actual incremental value added by your individual component relative to other available components, which is like the, so yes, antitrust law is kind of all about this. I was sort of, sort of thinking thing. about it wrong. Uh, I have a question about if we were to do a social experiment starting from scratch, yeah. what are your initial assumptions and what are your um, predictions and your results? The reason I'm asking is because I am actually building a simulation game, MNT, uh, MMO, um, on accidentally radical markets. Mm -hmm. It started out as tragedy of commons. So that's why I'm asking. I didn't realize until the right people pointed me out to this conference. So that's my question. What would the assumptions be for, I guess it depends what kind of game you want to make. But, you know, uh, you could, uh, um, you, you could, you could create a, 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 a game where, where property in the game is, is owned according to uh, uh, Harburger tax mechanism. Uh, for example, and I, I know that there are, I'll, I'll be curious to talk to you afterwards and find out yeah. what you're doing. I know that there are other people doing things like that. So, you know, to follow up on Glenn's point about antitrust law, and maybe you have some comments on that, but one element that you could think about is the per se versus the rule of reason. So yeah. in, in antitrust, there are some uh, kinds of behavior that are per se wrong. So if you are proven to have done the thing, let's say uh, collusion to fix prices, if there's you know evidence that you've done that, ba boom, that's it. You've done the bad thing and you're 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 punished. Or collusion to fix wages, which is what I'm I'm uh, working on. So that's and so that seems. Maybe it was done for prospective or forward-looking reasons, but it, it starts to look a little bit as, or it could be interpreted as retribution. You've been a bad guy, you're engaged in this bad behavior that we don't condone, here's your punishment. And then there's the rule of reason analysis, so certain kinds of behaviors we recognize as potentially anti-competitive, potentially leading to bad effects. An example would be a merger between two companies. It may lead to adverse anti-competitive effects, or, or it may not. So then we can start to analyze, you know, hey, is this the right thing to do based on future anticipated consequences? And you know, there's other examples in antitrust law about, for example, um, things like uh, um, no poaching agreements in the case of franchises. There's a whole debate yeah. about that right now whether they are pro-competitive or anti-competitive, and, you know, and that depends a lot on the consequentialist reasoning of how this particular behavior by market actors is going to impact outcomes. And we don't just say, oh, this is wrong, which would be the per se uh, you know, category of acts that are you know, wrong per se, like just having yeah. done it is bad. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about the sort of classification of property thing, but this is all uh, exactly right, yeah. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you.